As most of you know by now, I'm Carol Burns. I'm head of creative writing here at the university and run this uh, series that we love to do called Writers in Conversation in association with Nuffield Theater. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. And we're very excited to have Philip Henscher here as our guest. Um, Philip is a novelist and journalist, as I think you all know. He won the Somerset Mom Award for Kitchen Venom in 1996. His semi-autobiographical novel, The Northern Clemency, was shortlisted for the Mann Booker Prize. His books are about a wide variety of subjects, often against a background of historical change, whether at the, wall, the fall of the Berlin Wall in Pleasured, the first Afghan war in the Mulberry Empire, the war of Bangladesh's independence in scenes from early life, over a long period of change in recent English history, the Norman Clemency. He has written that he is drawn to detailed accounts of the texture of life, to the rich techniques of realism, as well as to disruptive forms and incomplete gestures more characteristic of contemporary writing. He also recently edited, somewhat controversially, the Penguin Book of the British Short Story, Volume 1 and 2, which was published last year. He has been described as a master ventriloquist whose writing is emotionally engaged and compulsively readable. It also strikes me as an American that he is, um, in his precise and very wide-ranging um, depiction of British life, a very British writer and one that helps me understand the world I'm now living in. <laughs> so, um, which believe me, sometimes I need some, you know, explanations. So um, anyways, we're gonna start by talking a bit, and then he's gonna read a bit, and then you're gonna ask some questions, you can ask questions at any point, and then he's gonna read a bit more, and then we'll see how we're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of the things that also strikes me about your books, I think which strike everyone, is how diverse your writing is, um, both in terms of form. You do novel and short, short novels and historic novels and stor short stories and journalism, but also topic, the Roman Empire, the Bauhaus art in the 1920s Germany, and a gay bookshop in London in 1970s, and that's just one novel. So. Uh, I imagine that's important to you then as a writer to, to sort of explore mm. different areas? Well, I, I, would really, I would really love to be one of those authors that really enjoyed writing within the same kind of genre and not to write the same book over and over again, but to find infinite amounts of variety within quite a constrained, um, constrained style. And I envy those novelists a lot. I really envy somebody like... Um, like Anita Bruckner, whose books are very much within the same kind of territory and within the same tone, and where you know she just f found so much to write about within a kind of tiny area. But I'm just not one of those writers, and I think the thing is that I'm very easily bored in life. I'm very easily bored, and the and I don't really like writing as well. I think like a lot of writers, a lot of writers will tell you they don't really like writing. So I always resist writing. I don't really think I'm going to write another novel. I always think when I finish a novel, that's the last time I'm ever going to do that. And when a novel, when a novel first occurs to me, it's always some kind of tiny little suggestion. And I think, oh, I'll, um, I, maybe I'll do, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. You know? And then it kind of builds up more and more suggestions that maybe you could do that. And um, Quite often, um, you know, where by the time it's got to the point of having to be written, um, that there doesn't seem any alternative. This novel is really banging on the door, saying, "You've got to write me now." Um, it's uh, the first time I've, I've grown to dread the first time I tell anybody about it because they often just stare at me as though, "Well, that one," you know. And I think the worst one. And I just didn't understand this one at all. Was uh, a novel I wrote called *The Mulberry Empire*, and um, I'd written three novels that all set in the very recent past, all about modern 
life. And um, all through the 90s, I, I, stopped, I was just getting interested in Afghanistan. And, um, and there wasn't really a lot of interest in the West in Afghanistan. We just knew that there were these mad people called the Taliban who were doing terrible things there, but no one was really paying that much attention to it. And I kept thinking, I, I, read, I read this account of the first time the British invaded Afghanistan in the 1830s, and I got totally fixated on it. And I just didn't understand why I was so fixated about it. And for probably about four years, I kept thinking, oh, if I wrote a novel about the first Afghan... No, no, I'm not going to write it, I'm not going to write it, I'm not going to write it. And then about two months later, oh, that, that novel about the first Afghan war, that would be a nice scene if... No, 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 no. And, and finally, I'm, I'm, not, I'm serious, after about four years, it was actually more effort not to write the bloody novel. And I finally just sat down with great impatience, say, oh, I'm going to write you then, God. So it's always been like that. It's always kind of, it's always kind of defined itself, really. And I've kind of had to find the way to write about this subject and write this novel. And it's, it's really kind of forced its way onto me. Whenever I've made too much of a decision too early on about the sort of novel that I'm going to write. Um, it, it's never been quite as good as the ones that um, just uh, jump on top of me and just force me to write what it wants me to write. And at the end, you know, the novel is its own thing. It's kind of defined itself. It's, um, it's grown up. It's, um, it's, what ima it's what I imagine um, having children is like actually you kind of do the initial work and then um, and then before you know it there there it is you know six foot two and 14 years old on the other side of the street embarrassing you <laughs> you know that's what that's what it's like so i don't know and i never know what the next novel yeah. is going to be uh, to be like but it sounds yeah. like there's a long germination period yeah. where you can't rush it no so you need to sort of let it trust yourself to do it when it's ready. Yeah, yes. It, it, um, it, is a, it is a long, it is a long, long germination project, pro, uh, process and um, it takes <coughs> ages before I get to the point of, um, of wanting to write or being able to write. And you mustn't, for me, you mustn't sit down and start to write too early. You've got to wait until it can't wait any longer. You know, um, it's um, it, it's an odd one. There's all there's always kind of little ideas bubbling away in um, um, bubbling away in your head that um, you know might lead to uh, might lead to novels or um, you know might not. I don't know. <laughs> Tweets. Sorry. Tweets. If not a novel, then a tweet. It <coughs> no, can turn into a, bit, a tweet. They're a bit more elaborate. Than <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Do you do you have a storyline, and do you, like do you know the ending when you mm. do finally sit down, or does it depend on the book? It's it's different. I often, um, I know the um, I know the beginning. I always know a, the. Um, Sorry, <laughs> that sounds absurd. I know the beginning when I start to write. Yeah, um, I, w I, I can't start to write until I have a situation for the first 30 or 40 pages which is going to go off in a number of directions. Mm -hmm. Put it like that. And I have a sense of the way it's going to develop. I have a sense of, you know, the crisis or maybe some kind of, some kind of knot that it'll work towards. And... Oddly, I can, I can often kind of hear what the end of the novel is going to be, sound like without, um, without quite knowing what is going to, what's going to go into it or what it's going to say. And that's a very strange one. I know for the, um, for the Mulberry Empire, which is about you know, the triumph of the Afghans um, over the... The British. I had this. Um, I could hear the last pages of the uh, of the Mulberry Empire, and it was like this very kind of hieratic noise. It was like two two men on either side of a mountainous valley, each with a massive gong, and just hitting it in turns. And um, 
And I, di I didn't really know what it was going to go into that until I was about two thirds of the way through it, really. Um, I, th I, di I think that the thing that you mustn't do as a novelist is to give in to temptation and write ahead. You know, I've always got a scene about two thirds of the way through. And all the way I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh, I'm really looking forward to that bit where she slaps his face in Debenhams or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes when the work's not going well, you think, actually, what I could do, I could write that scene in Debenhams. That'd be, but you mustn't do that. You've got to kind of hold it out to yourself as a kind of promise of, you know, the day that I finally managed to write the scene I've been looking forward to. So you write in order. Yeah, yeah. Then. Absolutely. Write in order. Yeah. I, I know not everybody does, but uh, I, I just couldn't write yeah. any other way. Yeah. And do you chart it out, or you just have it in your head, it sounds? Um, I've chart, I chart out less and less as I get older. And um, I think actually what it is, it's, it's kind of teaching, um, it's teaching creative writing. And, um, and I've often seen very well-organised and thoughtful students who come up with this beautiful plan of, uh, of exactly what's going to happen in what chapter. And, and I, I used to say, that looks absolutely fantastic. That looks great. It looks really convincing. It looks like a summary of a novel that's already been written. And then I've noticed very often they get kind of a way into it and they just don't know how to go any further with it. And I think what it is, is that if you over plan, then what's the, what's the pleasure in it for you? It's like, mm. it's like kind of doing painting by numbers. You're, you're kind of fulfilling the instructions that you laid down for yourself two years before. Mm. And I think there's a, you know, I think you need to um, just um, open it up and let your characters surprise you with what they've decided to do and what they've decided that they're not going to do. Yes, yes, if you over-determine it, it doesn't leave that yeah. room for a surprise that yeah. you haven't really... Every novelist says this, and I know you mm -hmm. sound... I know a novelist sounds completely insane when they say this, but um, your, your characters, you know, they do surprise you with what they will do, mm -hmm. and you don't know what they're going to, to do. Or more, more often... Um, I think the thing, I, I don't mind them doing stuff that, they, that they've decided that they're going to do that you didn't know they were going to do. What uh, drives me up the wall is when they won't do something <laughs> that you're sure they were going to do. And the example that I, I've, you know, that I've, I'm, I'm fixated on this example because it was so infuriating. I'm you know, always saying it in, in readings. So I wrote this uh, novel called The Northern Clemency, and from the beginning I had two teenagers living opposite each other in this slightly boring suburb, and they were kind of 15 and 16 years old, and they were just, they'd just been, they were both very good looking, very, very sexy, and they'd been eyeing each other up for um, about 150 pages at this point, and it was a very hot day in the novel, and I sent both of their parents, sets of parents, out. And, uh, and he walked out in the garden and said, uh, yeah, do you want to come over for a drink? And she came over, and I got them to go upstairs into his bedroom. And then they looked at each other and said, actually, let's not. And I was like... <laughs> but... I know you sound insane because you're, you, you could just say it, you could just type. And then she kissed him and then they won't, but you can't, you can't. If you get to that point and you realise these two people that you've made up, actually when they can't come close together, no, they're not going to, then you can't make them do it without ruining everything that, that they are, really. Yeah. It's, it's maddening <laughs> writing a novel and quite, quite large parts of it, you do feel even to yourself, <laughs> um, again, questions from the audience are always <gasps> welcome. I'll occasionally look up. Um, yes? Uh, I do the good writing, but I, I can't sustain it forever. And the idea of having a novel that's going to take me a minimum of two years, I'm not going to manage it. So yeah. probably you know, the short story, the, the quick burst of energy, Almost 
almost always the thing that um, the thing that leads a that means that a novel goes into the sand um, is that you've run out of things to do with your initial material, and you know if you start a novel with uh, with five people, five or six people then it's very exciting for a bit. You know, people talking to each other, people going to bed with each other, people punching each other outside pubs, people saying, I'm going to run away to Southampton with Sylvia. But then, about 25,000, 30,000 words in, they've all run off with each other. They've all been to bed with each other. They've all said everything that, you know, what do you do now? The answer is that you introduce three more people, you know. And uh, this is this was what Dickens used to do. If, whenever things start to run down in energy, he just used to throw a couple of more characters onto the fire. <laughs> That's my tip. <laughs> it's uh, the only thing to do is just to keep on keep on going. Actually, I do think that it's uh, that it's probably not the case that short stories are easier to write than short fiction. Uh, also, a novel doesn't necessarily take two years to write. So I'm always saying to my students, um, so Stondahl wrote The Chart House of Palmer in 49 days. You can, it's more, more great novels, I think, were written very quickly than were written very, very slowly. So your most recent book was a yeah. book of short stories, yeah. Tales of Persuasion. And um, I'll ask you one question before you read. Okay. And that was, and it immediately followed your um, editing of the Penguin Book of the British Short Story, in which you read some 20,000? Oh, I don't know whether I really did. I just <laughs> said that. Sounded good. It was but only a lot. It did it, in, lot. how might it have influenced your own? So then well, you, you know, after reading all that and deciding which ones were the best, yeah. you then had to, you then quite bravely, I think, went and wrote some well, yourself. The, it, it, well, it, it wasn't quite like that because uh, actually it's, um, it's 17 years since I last published a volume okay. of short stories. So these short stories have been written, you know, from time to time during that, um, that, that period. Um, it's, uh, it did cross my mind that it might, be, um, it might be an arrogant thing to do. But then I thought, um, well, nobody can say, you know, he... Um, um, he thinks he's a wonderful short story writer um, because I didn't put myself into the author <laughs> book of the British short story, you know, so uh, well, I was modest there. It was also sort of brave because it seemed mm. like it was very hard for reviewers to resist going and reading your introduction and then <laughs> looking yeah. at whether you met your, yeah. your own definition of a good short story, which is entirely <sighs> silly. But well, I don't, I don't think I have a good definition of a good short story. I think that they... Um, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, I think I, um, I think I disagree with some current definitions of what a, what a good short story is, judging by some of the things that people have given prizes to recently. But um, uh, that's but that's fine. You know, I've got my definition, and they've got fifteen thousand pounds. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I don't know. I thought of them as such kind of different, different things. I suppose the one, um, the one thing that uh, that I thought I I would do uh, with this collection is that sometimes I was just so sometimes reading for the um, for the uh, for the Penguin book. I was just so overwhelmed with a short story that I thought I want to steal that and I wrote a kind of I wrote a couple of variations on um, variations on uh, on stories some of which I put in the, uh, the the anthology and some of which I didn't I've always you know I've, I've always acknowledged uh, that there's one for instance called the painter's sons which is um, a variation or contemporary variation on a really great short story by D.H. Lawrence called the daughters of the vicar and the, uh, the, the story of the daughters of the vicar is um, a daughter of a vicar in a Nottinghamshire mining town outrages them by falling in love with a miner and crossing the class divide and, and just going off with this, um, the, with this miner. And I, th I th tried to, I was thinking of a, um, um, 
I was thinking of a contemporary equivalent, and um, and I th had is about a um, a painter and his wife on a Greek island, and they've got uh, five children, six children, um, and two of the sons are gay, and the mother is very kind of supportive about having gay sons until one of them falls in love with a Swiss tourist who's a manager of a branch of Starbucks. <laughs> and anyway, it works this way. It's not, it's not a funny story, but the situation just struck me as uh, equivalent. Yeah. But um, apart from that, you know, it goes off in very different directions. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's, let's hear one. I thought I'd read um, a short, shortish short story. And um, this, is the, this is about the only uh, story in the book that was actually commissioned. And um, it was commissioned by The Guardian. And uh, they wanted various people to write a uh, short story inspired by a bizarre fact from the news in previous years, in the previous year. And the, um, the one that I chose was the um, extraordinary fact that Berlusconi, Silvio Berlusconi, as part of his punishment, was, um, had to go and work um, for two afternoons a week in uh, a, an old people's home. And the thing that this made me think was that um, a few years ago, um, my, uh, my mother had a, um, had a brain hemorrhage and was in a coma for, um, for a number of months. When she came out of the coma, before she recovered, she was very susceptible to all sorts of delusions. And one of them was that if she'd seen uh, if she saw some um, Tony Blair on the television in the, the ward, then she couldn't distinguish between television and reality. And if you came to visit her in the afternoon, she would tell you very certainly that, uh, that Tony Blair had been to visit her that morning. You know, there was no, there was no kind of delusion. There was, no, there was no ambiguity in her mind. It just had happened. And, you know, it took quite a long time before, you know, everything <coughs> clarified. So I thought I would write a story about a, a woman at the, near the end of her life who um, is looked after by Silvio Berlusconi, but um, is not quite sure what's, um, what's, what's happening. It's narrated by her. It's called A Lemon Tree. The terrace here has plants on it. Lavender, jasmine. It smells nice. They're the plants from the terrace at home. At home, my mother waters them every night and every morning. She comes out and says something about the heat of the day. Then she waters the plants. The kind people who work here have brought the lavender and the jasmine from the terrace at home in Naples to make me feel at home. Nothing is too much trouble for the kind people. It is nice to be at a spa. This spa is not like the spa my father took us to last year and the year before. We always go to Montecatini Terme in Tuscany. This is not Montecatini Terme. There you drink the waters and talk in the streets to the same people you see every year. The waters are good for your digestion. Sometimes in Montecatini Terme, you and your, or your parents are talking to a friend in the street and then suddenly the friend is not there anymore. He has gone to the lavatory to answer a call of nature. In Montecatini Terme, it is not necessary to say goodbye or apologise for leaving. Everyone knows you just turn away and absent yourself. And one day, you realise that your three weeks' stay is over and tomorrow you too must leave. It is over and you must go home to Naples. In Naples, we have lavender and jasmine on the terrace and my mother waters them every day, twice a day. The kind people who work here have brought the lavender and jasmine from our terrace and put it outside where I can see it. It makes me feel at home. Sometime I will have to leave the spa and go back home. It has been a nice holiday. There have not been any waters to drink, but the kind people have made me comfortable. There is risotto to eat sometimes and sometimes soup, a cold, bright, green vegetable soup. Very nice. The vegetable soup is my favourite to eat and I look forward to it. Last year, I went with my parents, and the year before that, we went to Montecatini Terme in Tuscany. This year, I came here, and my parents did not come. They went to Montecatini Terme. There is plenty of time left, 
before I have to go back home. My brother is here. I see him sometimes at the other end of the room when the television, where the television set hangs on the yellow wall. But once I went over to say hello and found myself about to speak to an old man by mistake. I don't know where my brother went. The kind people who work here make us comfortable and talk to us. Sometimes it is the kind ladies, the ones from Africa, who bring us our lunch and our supper. There is a kind lady from Russia who does not talk, who hits us when we are slow to get into bed, and she is in a hurry. There are some strict gentlemen and strict ladies too who come and ask me questions. I have told them these things before, but I don't mind them telling them again. I am between 40 and 50 years in age. It is 1974. Sometimes I make a small joke and I tell them that the year is 1975. The strict ladies write this down just the same. The name of the Pope in the Vatican is John Paul, and he is Polish. They ask us the names of other people. They are different questions, but they always ask us the name of the Prime Minister of the country, Silvio Berlusconi, I always say. I look down when I say this. Berlusconi is a very good friend of my husband, Pierluigi, who is away at Montecatini Terme with my parents. In the past, he has come round to our house and sat and told us about what he wants to do, and sometimes he has sung a song. I do not tell the strict ladies and gentlemen about this. There is no need. In the mornings, they ask us what Silvio Berlusconi does for this country, and in the afternoon, Silvio Berlusconi comes to the spa, and he visits us. There are mostly old people at this spa. I am the youngest here, 30 or 40 years younger than the rest of them. The old man who sits in the chair next to me, he dribbles in his risotto at table, and we pretend not to notice. They ask all of us one by one who the Pope is and who the Prime Minister is. The old man in the chair next to me, the risotto dribbler, he gets the answer right about the Pope, but then he says that the Prime Minister is Craxy. The strict lady writes the answer down. She does not correct him. She goes on to the next old person who knows, like everyone else, that the Prime Minister's name is Silvio Berlusconi. I want to ask the old man how he can say something so stupid, but I don't. In the afternoon, the Prime Minister sometimes comes to visit us. Bettino Craxi has never been to visit us, and he never will. On the terrace, the lavender and jasmine come from the terrace in Naples. The kind people who work here brought it to make me feel at home. I like to smell it when the win windows are open and it makes me feel homesick and it stops me feeling homesick. The kind people brought the lavender and the jasmine here. Silvio Berlusconi does not look as he looks, but I, now I know that is what he looks like. His hair is black and smoothed down and his skin is tanned the colour of the risotto. He smiles at us, but I did not think he recognised me at first. Now he has remembered me, and he talks to me sometimes when he comes. Once he sang the line of a song to me, and he held my hand, and I knew the tune. Volare, cantare. Other famous people come to the spa to visit us. Eros Ramazzotti comes. He is the grandson of one of the old ladies. Sophia Loren has come with her pet dogs, one un under each arm. And Gina Lollabrigida, very beautiful, as beautiful as ever. I recognised her immediately, but I said nothing. Nino Brunacci comes very often. He was my favourite star when I was young, and it is so nice that he comes very often to visit us. He comes so often because he is one of the kind people. He is a big star, but he does not mind cleaning up when one of the old people has an accident. He has not grown any older, but the most regular one who comes is the Prime Minister. It is nice that the Prime Minister comes. He comes because he wants to hear what ordinary people think and what ordinary people like us are saying. He does not clean up after accidents, but he sometimes brings us our risotto or our vegetable soup, putting them down in front of us. Vegetable soup is my favourite. Silvio Berlusconi sets it down and he asks me if I'm good to go. Sometimes I'm not sure what Silvio Berlusconi means, but I agree and pick up the spoon to eat it. 
Sometimes Silvio Berlusconi says that I am his favourite old dear, and if he ever runs out of talent, I'll be at the top of his list. Silvio Berlusconi is an old friend of my husband, and so he talks to me like this, and neither of us minds it. My husband would not mind it if he was here. My husband is in Montecatini Terme with my parents. He did not want to come here. We will meet again in Naples. I will tell him all about the things that Silvio Berlusconi has said to me and how nice it was that I and Silvio Berlusconi were at the same spa and Silvio Berlusconi was a kind person giving me some soup to eat. Sometimes a kind man comes to visit me. He calls me Nonna. He sits with me and sometimes he talks and sometimes we sit and we watch the television together. Today Miss Lola Brigida came on the television and I explained that she had come to visit us all only that morning. He shook his head, the kind man who calls me Nonna. But I explained again about all the people who come to visit, about Sophia Loren and Gina and Marcello Mastroianni and Nino, but he had not heard of Nino Brunacci. And not just stars, but the Prime Minister too, I explained. Silvio Berlusconi comes to visit. I often talk to him, I said. He gives me risotto to eat, if it is a risotto day, and a vegetable soup, if it is a vegetable soup day. Oh, nonna, the kind man says, soon it is time for him to leave. But quite soon after he leaves, Silvio Berlusconi comes into the room. He has been at the spa all day. Just now he was working in the kitchen. He takes off his washing up gloves and comes over to me to say goodbye for the day. I want to say something to him, because behind him I can see the kind lady from Russia just taking off her coat, and I do not want to be left alone with the kind lady from Russia. I ask him if he knows the plants outside. They come from my father's terrace in Naples, the lavender and the jasmine. They smell here just as they smell in Naples, I was thinking of leaving them here. It would be kind to all these old people. But Silvio Berlusconi says something. You didn't bring the lemon tree then, he says. I'm very surprised that he should remember that we had a lemon tree on the terrace at home. But he is right. They brought the lavender and the jasmine from home, but they have not brought the lemon tree. My father will be very disappointed at that. I agree with Silvio Berlusconi. Then Silvio Berlusconi puts on his own coat and the big blue car that sits outside the spa sometimes takes him away. I close my eyes. I pretend to sleep. The Russian kind lady is in the room. I don't want her to know that I see her. I don't want her to catch my eye. Sometime soon it will be time to return home. Sometime soon the holiday will be over. I've had a good time. It has been a long time. Soon it will be over and time to go home. That was very sad. <laughs> and that's a compliment, of Thank course. <laughs> no, I mean, it's um, yeah, a very moving ending as well. Thank you. Um, did you know that was going to be such a sad story when you started it out? I don't know that I, I don't know if it's such a sad story. <laughs> um, I, I think often, um, quite often with, with short stories, um, the, the kind of seriousness of what the story is going to say emerges after some time. I've sometimes been taken aback by um, how, um, by a kind of um, level of emotion that a short mm. story has um, unveiled, really. Yeah. I mean, with that, actually, what, um, uh, what, I wanted to, what I wanted to do when I was starting it out, um, I... Um, um, one of the things that um, that, I've, uh, that uh, doesn't actually do, that uh, often happens to 
uh, to people with Alzheimer's is that kind of circling conversation. And I just wanted to just, and people, and it's one of the things that literature isn't really allowed to do, to kind of repeat itself. And just for once, I just wanted to let somebody come back to the same subject and, you know, not, and as a, as a kind of writer of a story, not to be impatient mm -hmm. with her, not to, not to kind of skate over the fact that she was coming back to the same things and saying the same things three or four times, mm -hmm. really, but just to kind of sit there and be a little bit supportive. I kind of felt, actually writing it, I felt as though the story was actually kind of sitting next to her and taking a hand and listening patiently. At least that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Oh, nice. And the, um, the repetition of Berlusconi, Berlusconi, Berlusconi is really yeah. effective as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, questions from the audience? Question at the or is that just somebody? No, I can see. I can see. It's, it's cost us. He's got his hand up. Oh, go ahead. I can't. You're um, completely in the dark from here. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Mulberry Empire, um, okay. which, for, for most of its length, can kind of perceived as a kind of straightforward historical novel. Well, I mean, there are. Yeah. It is a kind of series of pastiches of, of writers that you can kind of pick up on. Yeah. But like the novel itself is a kind of straightforward kind of set in the you know, first half of the war. But then, kind of near the end, there's this moment where. <laughs> There's a character in the middle of the Afghan desert and he kind of looks up in 1830-something and sees a jet plane across mm. the sky. In 1837. It's a moment because you know, it, it's, it's difficult at that moment to know how to read that. It doesn't feel no. like a magical realist. No. It doesn't feel like a straightforward postmodern kind of... So what's, how does that come about? It's, uh, do you know, it, it was the strangest, strangest moment and... I mean, I was writing it in, I would have written that about 1998, 1999. And I've never, ever in my life felt such a compulsion as a writer to do something. And everybody, everybody, well, I had to fight so hard for that, uh, for that sentence. What happens is, I mean, the whole novel has been this kind of, you know, this you know, in, illusion that we are in 1836 and the carriages are choo -choo 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 -choo, and there's not a single word if I could help it out of place and then they just, he just gets on his horse, he rides out and there's this noise that he's never heard before the hero Burns is in the middle of the desert in Afghanistan and looks up and there's a jet plane going across the sky and that's it, it doesn't explain why there's a jet plane and after that the, uh, the novel goes back and Everybody said, no, you can't have this. Why are you doing this? What, what is it? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. He said, why are you doing it? I don't know. I just had to do it. And, uh, you know, my, my editor was furious with me. And, but I, I just said, I've got to do it. I don't know why. I've just got to do it. And the, the thing that I compare it with was um, one of my best friends um, is, a, um, is a composer called Thomas Hades. And... About the same time, um, the New York Philharmonic commissioned him and about seven or eight other international, um, international composers to write a celebratory piece for the, uh, for the 31st, of, uh, 31st of December 1999 for the millennium. And seven out of the eight composers wrote a kind of big celebratory overture with kind of <laughs> symbols. And Tom wrote this piece called America, a Prophecy. <laughs> and it was an ancient Mayan text about invaders coming from the east. And it, the text was like, your cities will burn, you will die, you will die, you will die. And I said to him afterwards, what were you thinking of? He said, I don't know, I just had to do it. I said, what was the atmosphere like afterwards? And he said, chilly, <laughs> very chilly. But he, he said, you know, oh, we've talked about it since, and he said he just had to do it. And, and then, you know, a year later, September the 11th, suddenly, you know, there, were, there, you know, there, there it was. And, and I, I can't really understand it, but I just felt such kind of compulsion to put this, you know, this novel that really was about 
the effects of you know a catastrophe in Afghanistan, you know what it was going to mean. I just had to put a jet plane flying westward in at this at this point. It, you know when I, I I mean I don't you know claim any you know claim anything special, but it really was like something speaking to me at that point. It was a, it was a, I, don't, I don't think it'll ever happen again. At least I hope it I hope it doesn't. But um, I think in artistic terms, what I finally said to the um, to my editor was um, um, I've just got to break the neck of the illusion at one point. I can't have people starting on page one and going through to page 537 and living in this kind of safe, you know, closed, historic world. I want them just at one point just to go, Oh yes. Okay. All right. This actually means something. This is something for for us. You know what's going on in Afghanistan. It's not kind of over and done with. I, I guess. But it was um, it was a strange, irrational compulsion. Do you think that's an example of at times it might be good to write what you don't know? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I think you. Um, I think you have to write what you. Um, uh, what you don't know. I think sometimes you you start by not not knowing not knowing what you're writing, and at the end you don't know what you're writing, and it hasn't been a great success. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there are things that uh, there are things that I know that I don't know that I will never ever understand, but uh, I just don't write about them. <laughs> um, one of the things that struck me about. Hmm some of your stories that you have these like amazingly colorful characters but the narrator tends to be like sort of in in the audience yeah there's even a line here it reminds me of actually I have a theory about british people somehow that they they can sometimes do this little innocent abroad thing where they're sort of like sort of taking all this crazy american stuff or whatever country you want to go to in and i was just wondering if you know mm. how you well, I mean, those people are entertaining, but... Mm. Well, I think as a narrator, you don't want the person that's, you, you know, as the, um, as, um, as the narrator of a fiction, you don't want uh, someone like Honey G. You don't want somebody in the metallic uh, tracksuit going, <laughs> me, me. You know, you want somebody who's actually going to be a bit observant, a bit kind of sitting on yeah. one side, really. And my theory about Harper Lee, incidentally, yeah. is the reason she stopped writing and the reason that she couldn't go on writing was the sort of writer that she was, was, the, was a quiet person sitting in a corner of a room writing a novel about the way that people in a small community relate to each other. Now, imagine trying to gather material if suddenly you're this massive bestseller. Every time she went into a, a you know, a, 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 a room in, you know, in that small town, everybody would start to talk in a very kind of self-conscious way. I think it would have been very, very difficult. I think all the, um, you know, I think most of the, uh, most of the great novelists have been, um, you know, gawpers and standers yeah. on one side and, and um, you know, and able to disappear into, yeah. you know, even Dickens, who of course was, you know, enormous celebrity, he went on walking at night through the city, presumably because, you know, at night walking through Victorian London, you, are, you were invisible and you saw, uh, you know, extraordinary things. Mm -hmm. So I think, the, I think that kind of quiet narrator on the edge of, um, outbreak of madness is quite a good sustainable practice. Well, I mean, there's a lot of examples. Yeah. You know, of Nick Carraway and the great Gatsby and, yeah. I mean, yeah. and it is... Yeah, Gatsby could never have narrated his own story. Yeah. Oh. Although I suppose um, Humbert Humbert narrates his. Yes. Yes. Okay, leave me But there. then you have yeah. a really voicey, I mean, that's, that's the other option. You have a really voicey narrator mm. and half of the story is the voice. And yeah. The, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think that, that, is, that is possible. But um, 
Was Humbert Humbert sustainable? I mean, could you really go on writing novels this yeah, I don't know. Oh, right. No, you wouldn't want, like, multi-volume no. No. Humbert Humberts. Yes. No, <laughs> no. But you, you, do want, um, you do want endless novels by... Um, um, oh, no, well, let's... Yeah. Okay, yeah. I've, I've can't think. I can't think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, other, other questions? People are quiet and shy tonight. Why is that? Why is that? Yes. I was reading uh, uh, A.P. Dacroyd's biography of Dickens, and there's, but he goes to write Nicholas Nickleby, he goes to Yorkshire to research it, he sort of research all these brutal schools, mm. uh, and he's already so famous that he's already being recognised, and everything is kind of tainted. Really? Like, yes, that's only Nicholas, Nicholas Nickleby. Wow. And then, of course, when he goes, he, as you say, walk, 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 yeah. walk, 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 goes walking in the dark. Wow. Your, your jet flight really reminds me of the film, uh, the scene in The Man Who Felt Worth, when Thomas Jerome Newton is being driven through the New Mexico desert, and he's an alien, and it's 1985, supposedly a film made in 1975. Um, and he suddenly drives through a sharecropper's, share, 19th century sharecropper's plantation, yeah. and they see a sedan car being driven uh, through their, the fields they are, they are working. Yeah. And suddenly we'll go see the burst of banjo on the uh, soundtrack, so nothing, it's never explained, there's no... Oh. And it's, that's what's... <laughs> no, I've that's never... It's the same thing, really, it's a yeah. like fracture of time. I've know. never seen it, I will dash yeah. out to... Well, uh, and Nick Rose is a real kind of novelist in film. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, I'll dash out to see that, yeah. 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 So, you're impressively prolific. When you said two years oh. to write a novel, it takes longer than that for a lot of people. So how do you... Do you have any, mm. how do you manage that? It doesn't feel prolific. <laughs> it really doesn't feel prolific. I know it, lo it looks like it, but it, it doesn't feel like it. I've just, um, um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think actually the, um, um, you know, the, the, the thing that you feel as a, you do feel as a writer is that, um, is the thing that you do that because, um, you couldn't do anything else, you know. There is no, there is no job that I could do really. I couldn't hold, I couldn't hold down a job. I couldn't hold down any other job. I'd be sacked within a week, really. And um, you know, if 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 you can't if you can't go on with a novel, then uh, I don't know really. But I, you know, there are bits of it. There are bits of it that you love. I think that. Um, I, th I think there are kind of happy moments as a as a as a novelist. Towards the end is a happy moment, and actually, just kind of living with these these people can be very happy. Um, and I suppose that drives you onwards, really. Um, whether it will always go on driving you onwards, I don't know. It's done it so far. Um, I guess the uh, I guess the other thing is that um, you have to respect it. You know, you have to respect the 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 task, and you have to respect you know what um, what you do, and just be convinced that even if you're trying to be even if you're trying to be funny, that um, you you mustn't do it in a flippant way. You know, you mustn't um, you mustn't dash something off. You know, you mustn't. Um, you mustn't, I, I think, the first thing that I say to my students is, 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 at Bath Spa, um, I say well, we have a firm rule here that you are not allowed to apologise for your work at any point. And it's such a temptation mm -hmm. as a writer to, to pick up and say, oh, I, I wrote this, but I, I know it's not very good really. You know, I just dashed it off, it doesn't matter, you know. But uh, you just have to respect it and, yeah. and live with it and, and trust it, really. Yeah. I outlaw that in my, in my classes as well. Yeah. Don't I? It, it, I mean, the first class um, I said, okay, this is horrible and this is awful and I just wrote this and I don't know why I'm handing it in, but okay, no, that covers everybody for the semester, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Figure it yeah. out. Then. I also tell them they can't, tell, they can't say, this is brilliant, this is worth a week. But in practice, <laughs> in practice, I've got a lot more patience for that because sometimes, you, you know, sometimes writers do feel that it's great <laughs> and it's, it's, that's fine. Um, a last question before, yes. Or uh, unless there's anybody 
else. Go ahead, Oscar. Yes, Paul. I just ask, uh, a group of us have been at the university here, have been studying the Emperor Waltz. Oh, yeah. And so I said something this afternoon that I want you to answer for me. Because, <laughs> uh, I think you may be contradicted by what you said about your characters. I said, because I've been reading reviews, uh, all very complimentary, but mm. I think either the Financial Times or the Telegraph said you were a master ventriloquist. Now, I assume they meant mm. not throwing your voice, but being a master of many voices. And I said, no. nobody can produce that many voices without having a backstory for all of them. But is that true? Hmm. I um, I don't know that I do think that's true, actually. I think that um, um, something I do believe in very, very much is um, the um, close observation of the way people talk and people's favourite words and people's favourite turns of phrase, really. And I think that... Um, um, backstories kind of emerge from that, really. Uh, I'll give you, um, give you an example. I remember once applying for a job many years and years ago, and it was on those two-day event where you were shut up in a um, shut up in a in a room with other other candidates, and there was a a girl who would come very near where I uh, you know I grew up in in Yorkshire. And she'd taken steps to change her accent. And she'd gone a little bit too far. And she not only said um, um, uh, rub instead of rub, and um, uh, she didn't say a glass of rum, she said a glass of rum, um, but she'd taught herself, and I don't know why she taught herself this, to say putt, and I put it on a table, <laughs> and I was fascinated by this. And I, I, I remember kind of long hours in this recruitment procedure, and I was just gazing at her and thinking, why do you say putt, and why has nobody said to you, you don't say, nobody says putt, nobody says putt it on a table. And it, I don't know, I kind of felt that, though, if I'd worked at it, there was a whole kind of backstory probably there, including rather a rather an awful boyfriend who'd uh, been snobbish towards her and then dumped her in an awful way. And maybe um, maybe kind of dreams of I, I don't know, I had all sorts of dreams and speculations and and thoughts about her. But it all came from just, you know, this one way of talking. And that's always that's always gone on actually. I've always been really, really gripped by the way that uh, the, the way that uh, the way that people talk. I'm always um, I'm always asking people to repeat what they just said, which is uh, sometimes leads you to be quite unpopular. So I don't know. I know it's it's kind of um, it's kind of an actor's thing, isn't it? Backstory, but I never know why they ask that. I'm with um, Harold Pinter on this, who always refused to give anything like a backstory. He just said, well, they talk like that. That's all I, I know, really. Um, yeah. I, actually, The Emperor Wolves was quite a good example because quite a lot of it was um, about the way that people talk. And I'm very fascinated. I mean, about a third of the book is about, uh, the, is about gay Londoners. And, um, and I'm very fascinated by the way that... Um, um, gay Londoners in their 50s and 60s um, talk in quite different ways to, um, to, um, to gay Londoners in their, in their 20s. And there's a sort of um, elaborate camp style that, uh, that uh, older gay Londoners have that's often quite shockingly lewd. And, um, <laughs> the, and, and younger people just don't do it at all. You know, if you think of um, the difference between you know Quentin Crisp and Owen Jones, you know, it's, you know, I, I put a uh, I put a, um, a friend of mine um, in the book with his famous saying. It really is the only thing he's ever said that uh, anyone's remembered. Are you 
are you ready for a rather a vulgar yeah. thing? Okay. This dear friend of mine sure. who's who's sixty said to me once, um, when I go to, I'm gonna have to do his voice as well. When I go to bed with a man, I expect him to maintain full erection from the moment of nudity onwards. Anything less I regard as a personal insult. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was uh, that was something that I wanted to capture in the book. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear, come too far. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to hear some yes. good ventriloquism now. Before you start that, I wanted to ask you about yeah. this story called My Dog Ian. My Dog Ian. Were you purposefully playing with the idea of a shaggy dog story in this? Well, I don't really know, actually. <laughs> It is a shaggy dog story. It is, and it ends with a dog, so... Yeah, called Ian, <laughs> yeah. But actually, since I wrote this story, I think the, um, the whole tendency of giving dogs inappropriate names has rather taken off. I, I know people who call, have dogs called things like Ian, and uh, um, I know somebody who's got a dog called Elizabeth. I don't know why that's a kind of inappropriate name for a dog, but it is. Okay, I'm going to, um, I'll read a little bit. It's a bit less than the uh, uh, last one. Um, uh, it's narrated by an arts administrator in a city in the north of England. It was a city of 300,000 people, but still it hardly seemed surprising that I noticed Sylvia. In that place, she was like a panther at a Tupperware party. The society was less extensive than you might imagine. A small Italian woman with expensive, expensive accoutrements, an expensive, contemptuous way of standing with her hips jutting forward, made herself conspicuous. I had formed the habit of going to concerts in the university hall every other Friday. The tickets were cheap and the platform just about big enough for an orchestra. The timpanist had to sit beneath the conductor's podium, however, and guess at the beat. More usually, as tonight, it was a string quartet. In the interval, the audience sat in their seats or clustered in the chilly atrium drinking coffee. It was not a well-dressed audience, you noticed Sylvia. Have you seen, my colleague Margaret said, a footballer's wife? It was a recognised social category in that impoverished northern town with two famous football clubs. It was used for any woman under 30 with a tan and a handbag. I hope she enjoyed the vape and Margaret said bitterly, I went to concerts with Margaret. It was no more than that. I hope so too, I said. After the interval, I took more notice of Sylvia. She was sitting three or four rows in front of us on the other side of the aisle. She listened intently to the first two movements of the next piece. Then, with a sigh, just as the string quartet was raising its bows, she got up and left, clacking down the central aisle. The string quartet lowered its bows, waited for her to leave. They began to play again. A bit much for the footballer's wife, Margaret said archly when it was all over. The bitonal passage can be a little demanding for many music lovers. <laughs> I wasn't sure, not just because I didn't know what Margaret meant. To me, those decisive stilettos clacking towards the exit looked much more like someone who only wanted to hear the scherzo of the Ravel string quartet, had come for that, had left when it was done. In fact, Sylvia seemed to attend the university concerts fairly regularly. I started to notice her now and wondered why I hadn't noticed her before. She rarely stayed for a whole concert. She would turn up at the interval, leave after a particular piece, or even walk out, as with the Ravel, in the middle of one. It was terribly rude. It was the behaviour of someone, I decided, who had come to like music through a collection of CDs. This really dates this. <laughs> I'm just giggling. God, CDs. It's like, you know, uh, 45s. She had the habit of skipping about, selecting favourite movements, and rejecting music with all its tyranny and gleeful infliction of boredom in favour of highlights. Margaret had a great deal to say on the subject. I weakly agreed, though tried not to refer to Sylvia as the FW. I did not agree with Margaret as often as she seemed to assume, and sometimes rebelliously thought as I clapped exhaustedly at the end of some juvenile assault on a great masterpiece, that it might indeed be quite nice to press a fast forward button on Beethoven. 
There was no such fast forward button at the museum either. It took up as much time as you were prepared to grant, uh, grant it. I found out about the FW, Margaret said one day, popping her head round the door of my office. She's not an FW, a footballer's wife, I mean. She's a lettrice. A what? I said. A lettrice in the Italian department of the university, Margaret said immaculately. The equivalent of a lectrice in French, lectorin, I believe, in German. She's come to teach them Italian. It's not a big department, I said. In the museum, we like to think we had a relationship with the university that extended to sending Christmas cards to given departments, as long as no Bunsen burners were involved, at which point snobbery came into consideration. We did not know them, but we went to their concerts and we very well might have known them personally. Margaret, for instance, constantly referred to the professor of English literature, a man she had never spoken to and who was not called Percy, as Percy. <laughs> no, it's not, Margaret said. She's the first time they've been able to afford a lettrice. They cock a hoop about it. Where does the budget come from, though? I said knowingly. They'll have got sponsorship from an Italian company, Margaret said. Fiat. No, I tell a lie, it's Buitoni. They make ravioli, I said. They're sponsoring all sorts these days, Margaret said. The Halle had a bel canto evening in Manchester. There was a reception at the town hall hereafter. The whole orchestra went oysters, I heard. The cor anglais player was laid prostrate for a week. Only to be expected, I said. But they funded a lettrice for the Italian department here as well, Margaret said. I found out. She's called Sylvia. Do you think they'd be interested in giving us money? Buitoni, I mean. What for? Oh, I don't know. That's your pigeon, isn't it? Something Italian. Futurismo. Let's have a meeting. She's living with the professor of theology. She comes from Cremona. Ah, la bella Italia. She finished, clacking her hands in the shape of imaginary castanets for some geographically inaccurate but festive reason. You've been busy, I said. You know who I mean, the Australian professor of theology. Not that there's more than one, Margaret said, renting a room off him. Must dash. She dashed. As often happens in life, once you've acquired a certain body of information about a thing, a place, a person, it's impossible not to enter into a more active relationship with them. Once Margaret had told me all of this about Sylvia, it was inevitable that I would meet her very soon. It's something to do with the quality of the gaze. Once you know that a woman lives in the spare room of the Australian professor of theology, that she comes from Cremona, a town that, though famous for violin makers, only called up in my more slapdash mind the idea of a vast pudding, creamy and lemony at once, a city, more realistically, of pale yellow churches surrounded by a perfectly circular crimped wall, the warm colour of baked pastry. To be in possession of all this knowledge, both factual and fanciful, and yet to know that she knows nothing about you, not even your name, such a situation must engender a curious, knowing, unequal gaze. Thank you so much. It's one of my favorite stories in that collection. Oh, I'm you. glad you read from it. Um, so um, thank you all for coming. And thank you so much, Philip, for being with us tonight. Pleasure. Very much uh, enjoyed it. So um, a reminder to you all that our, our last writing and conversation of this semester is on December 5th with Helen McDonald. Um, so do not fail to buy your tickets for her. She does very few events these days. So it's really lovely and exciting to have her. And um, so um, October Books, our wonderful local bookstore, has books here for sale. Um, Philip is very happy to sign books, I am sure. So, um, and thank you all again for coming. We'll see you in a month. Thanks thank you. again, Philip. Thank you.